um, our session. So just so that you're aware um, as we move forward uh, so that we can kind of use this uh, for folks who aren't able to join us today and, and to reference um, later or following today's uh, session. So um, I want to take just a minute and let's see, take us to our shared folder here. Hopefully everybody can see uh, the shared folder. I just kind of want to orient you to how we um, have set things up. Of course, you will see um, our agenda, which I have embedded into the PowerPoint. Um, and hopefully um, you can access the PowerPoint presentation. I put two slides uh, per page uh, just so that some of the, the font is kind of small. So perhaps it will be easier for you to um, view. And then these equity questions, this is also a slide, but as we go into some breakout rooms, I thought it would be easier for you to access the questions instead of trying to use your phone to take a picture or to try to remember it if you're like me. Um, my uh, recall sometimes uh, is impaired, especially Monday morning. <laughs> Um, also, uh, what you will find is Zoom instructions for those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, but I, I got to say, probably by now we have Zoom experts. Um, and also our SST contact list, you will find um, Sherry's information, Sherry Lawrence, who introduced herself, um, Lydia Brodegard, myself, and then all of the other SST consultants. Um, as part of uh, SST 12. And then there is a next steps document. And then I am going to take just a minute to open up these subfolders. Um, so this first folder contains a lot of research and supporting documents. Um, some of this we're going to touch a little more than others. Um, this least dangerous assumption will probably be the first thing that we touch. Um, and then forward together, uh, the state of special ed um, profession survey report, and then the um, students with disabilities, and of course the phone is going to ring. Um, um, the NCEO uh, brief reports uh, regarding the students with disabilities and thinking about their uh, policy practice and professional ju judgment, what uh, should we expect? Again, some of these we're going to touch briefly, but I know that we have a lot of administrators on the line uh, or on the, um, uh, it's part of our event today. So these may be things that, you know, if you're questioned or um, even thinking about sharing these with some of your, uh, your staff, your admin team. So uh, those are there. And then um, I'm going to go to compliance and supporting documents. That'll be kind of like the next chunk of information that we're going to tackle or, or try to go through. And so you'll see, um, you'll see a lot of the um, documents uh, supporting alternate assessment, um, as well as our um, record review tools uh, that we have used specifically as part of um, our IDEA monitoring, but um, also um, just using them when we think about compliance. And then we've created a universal supports document that just kind of puts everything in one spot for you. Um, and then I'm going to highlight the last folder. Just again, I won't pull each one of them up just now, but um, these are all of the upcoming events outside of SST 12 that you might find um, helpful in supporting your work um, or your role or as administrators sharing this with your, um, your teachers um, and service providers. So um, those are all there for you. And I'll go back um, to our PowerPoint. Yeah. And 
So I'm gonna move my screen around here a little bit. Um, so today we're just gonna talk about, you know, why this network, um, Last year, we um, did a what we called a low incident network, um, but we are really thinking about those students in particular who really have those complex and intensive needs. And, and our fear was that if we continued to call it a low incidence network that, um, of course, uh, some of us have a very specific idea or understanding of what low incidence means. You know, I think maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, we might have thought autism was a low incidence disability, uh, but now, you know, that seems to be common, <laughs> a common disability category that we think about. So um, we really want to think about those, those students who really require um, a lot of support based on their needs. So, um, we're going to talk uh, specifically about you know the why of the network and and why when we think about our those students through the lens of equity and then our obligations around FAPE. Uh, we're going to talk about the the what and the how. You know how will we support our students thinking of or these specific students thinking about their needs and then those supporting documents and resources. Um, we'll spend some time talking about our updates and then those um, those next steps. Um, and as we think about networks, we know that um, probably the the greatest resource that you have is your colleagues. Um, so as part of this network opportunity, what we really want to make sure that we do is embed time. Uh, throughout uh, today so that you can network, um, that you can share ideas, share your resources. Um, but there will be opportunities for us to um, really address um, kind of some of these big ideas um, just through content um, or supporting um, supporting you with, you know, some of that background knowledge and, you know, maybe some new learning. Um, but then again, making sure that we provide opportunities for networking. Um, and we're taking a, a little bit different approach. Um, we weren't really quite sure uh, what this fall was going to bring with COVID. Um, you know, I heard the other day from uh, one of our colleagues that they had 35 staff members out with six subs. Um, to cover. Uh, and I know that that isn't just uh, an issue for that district. This tends to be um, an issue across the board um, and, and really across the state. So we, we weren't really sure how many teachers we would be able to access or, or have participate during this time. Um, so hopefully through the recording uh, in the shared folders, you will have access to the information and um, for the bulk of administrators that we have um, participating, you know, taking this information back to um, your teachers. But one of the things that we were hoping as we navigate all of the network sessions, we have five scheduled total um, with one hour sessions as optional sessions in between each three hour session. And the whole purpose for doing that was um, we hope that when you walk away from each of these sessions that you take away um, some resources, some information, some research, um, something that's going to help you improve um, your practice, especially as we think about students with complex disabilities. We know, especially for this population, there is not um, a quick fix. None of these Holly, things. Yes. I'm sorry. There, um, Katie is trying to get in and I am not getting notifications. Do you have a notification someone's um, in the waiting room? Uh, let me see here. Oh, yep. Okay. Thank you. And Lydia, I'm going to make you a co-host, maybe. Okay. Bear with me here.
So Lydia, you should be able, if, if folks are joining us later, um, you should be able to give them access. All right. And so for those of you who are just joining, if you'll go ahead and put your uh, name, uh, district, and role um, in the chat, that would be great. And I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, drop the shared link to our folder of materials and resources there for you. Um, but one of the things that um, I started to, to share was that um, our hopes for these sessions is that um, as you walk away with um, new resources, new ideas, um, is that you have an opportunity to come back um, and meet with us. This is not a requirement. This was um, just as a supporting opportunity for teachers, administrators, whoever, uh, to kind of share what happened after you tried um, some of these um, ideas or, or resources. And, and this will be up to you in terms of what you, what you try or you know, what you test. Um, so that you have an opportunity to kind of share your experience if things went well, if they didn't go well, um, or maybe something else that you stumbled across. So, um, for example, following today um, on October 13th um, from two to three, we'll set aside some time for you to join us again and, and kind of um, you know, join your colleagues and kind of pick each other's brains about, you know, those things that were, uh, that worked, that didn't work or things that you're going to maybe tweak or, or try a little bit differently. So, um, the other thing that we're asking, um, and I know, um, this probably is more than just one student, but as we navigate today, um, as we navigate the other um, sessions that we have scheduled, I want you to think about one specific student um, that you have either that has either transferred into your district, who is new to you in your classroom, um, or has maybe recently um, gone through some some type of event experience that has really posed um, some challenges that that has made you kind of step back and be like hmm not quite sure how to support this student or are we thinking about um, everything that we need to be um, to help this student be successful um, you know i oftentimes have conversations with uh, teachers who say things like, you know, I thought we were on the right path. We take one step forward uh, to then shortly take two steps back. I'm at a loss. I'm not quite sure what to do next. So those are the students that I really want to be mindful of. And as you think about some of these conversations and, and supporting documents uh, and resources, um, you know, that that will be helpful to you. All right. So let's talk about the why. We've shared a little bit about this um, idea or thought in terms of our network and really thinking about our, um, our students with disabilities. But uh, when we think about equity or when we hear equity, uh, there's lots of different things that um, may come to our, to our mind. Um, and we know um, we've heard a lot about equity um, over the past 10 plus years, right? Um, as defined here, you know, thinking about each child um, having access to relevant and challenging academic experiences and educational resources necessary for success across race, gender, thinking about ethnicity, language, disabilities, our, uh, the backgrounds of our families, um, as well as income. Um, educational equity means that each child receives um, truly what they need uh, to help them uh, develop their full academic and social potential, and that comes from the National Equity Project.
And so as, as part of our network, again, you know, it's important to us that, you know, you have a voice uh, in the network and, you know, as we have conversations uh, that perhaps will allow us to kind of guide our direction. Um, we have some thoughts in terms of what our next sessions will be uh, in terms of the map. Uh, but certainly as, as, we, as we share and, and as we have these conversations, um, you know, that will kind of help guide um, our direction. But what we want to do is um, break you into um, some uh, smaller breakout rooms and just have a discussion about what equity is and what equity is not. Uh, this is a handout um, in the shared folder so that when you go to your breakout room, um, you can either you can take a picture of it um, or you can access the handout so you kind of uh, remember what these these big points are. But <clears throat> we know that at, equity is an outcome. We reach it when gaps are gone and um, child reaches proficiency. It's an approach. Um, you know, we're being very intentional in terms of taking action to think about the unique needs of our, our children to help them be successful. Um, you know, we believe that each child can, um, can succeed and we know that it's a habit of practice, uh, both for our um, as an individual and, and really thinking about our, our organizations. Um, and it, what it's not um, are all students reaching the same level of accomplishment it's not a zero sum game. You know, we can improve outcomes for some students without diminishing outcomes for others. Um, you know, that's something that I've heard a lot, um, even um, in, in um, when I was in district. Um, it's not a one off or standalone initiative. So we're going to go ahead and um, put you into some breakout rooms and um, just have you take um, just a, a few minutes to just have some conversations about those points that perhaps really um, resonate with you. So bear with me here and we'll set those um, breakout rooms. All right, again, just have a quick conversation about those points that resonate with you in terms of what equity is or is not. And you should be getting notice about uh, joining a breakout room. Staff and not just, not just our intervention staff. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking about everybody and how do we, how do we get that message across? Right. Thank you, Janet. Anybody else? Holly, in our room, we talked about equity as far as secondary transition goes and how our students a lot of times are excluded from career tech programs um, because they may not complete the program or we use a lottery system or we have some type of evaluation or qualifications for them to enter in. Thanks, Georgia. Yeah, so that that whole topic of secondary transition is huge, right? Uh, when we think about trying to support our students. Um, any anybody else? Thank you, Georgia. I appreciate that. So I'm sorry if some of you were not able to access the um, the sheet. Um, I was trying to figure out how to, to get it to you and it was um, not cooperating. So my apologies if you were not able to access it. Um, we're trying to make life easier for you, not harder. So, all right. So um, thinking more um, <clears throat> about equity, this was probably one of the um, most powerful uh, statements that uh, Superintendent Paulo de Mario um, said as part of our SST Institute, you know, equity truly needs to be part of the fabric of our culture. You know, when we think about equity, you know, there's, there's many things that come to mind, but we think about our students who are Hispanic, we think about our students who are Black, uh, we think about our students who are Asian, uh, we think about our English language learners, um, students who are low income, but certainly for us, as we think about our network, 
you know, our lens or our focus truly is going to be thinking about our students with disabilities and specifically those students with disabilities who have some pretty challenging, uh, complex and intensive needs. <clears throat> But you know, certainly, we want our students with disabilities, even um, disabilities um, that are complex and intensive, at the levels um, that are comparable to their peers. Um, but that's um, you know easier said than done, right? Um, but we know that we also have an obligation to make sure that our students with disabilities. Um, um, are provided a free and appropriate public education in their least restrictive environment. Um, and again, when we think sometimes about our um, limited resources, uh, this can be a challenge. Um, so uh, for us, we know that there's barriers out there, um, but as opposed to um, thinking about all of the problems that we're faced with, we're really wanting to use this opportunity to think about you know, how can we be problem solvers? And, and perhaps one part of the region is doing something, maybe another part is not, or maybe you have a valuable resource. So we realize when we think about this population of students that um, it, it's hard work, right? Um, and we've been engaged in a lot of conversations as of late about, you know, the alternate assessment and students who are no longer able to participate and the, and the challenges that that brings. So there's some things that we know that um, we've been charged with that we're not going to be able to change, but how might we make some adjustments, even if they're small, um, or even if we're, we, we can't be to get to the point where we actually want to be, um, but maybe just even <clears throat> being okay with making some of those small changes along the way. <clears throat> so thinking about our students and even thinking about the one student um, that you're really considering as, as part of, you know, how do I support this student more? even thinking about our, our, our teachers and, and the uh, support staff that you interact with is, as administrators. Using your annotation feature, if you will, would you indicate which one of these topics you feel like your teachers or you um, need more help around? What are those big big topic areas that you feel like, you know what, <clears throat> this is what we need help with. If you can't find your annotation feature, which is up in the um, toolbar, mine for me is um, <clears throat> at the top of my screen. Uh, you can select any, any annotation feature to mark each of those areas. Um, if you can't access that, throw it in the chat. So glad you could join us. What we're doing is um, we are um, looking at all of these different areas um, and indicating where individuals are feeling like they need more help um, in, in terms of supporting students who have those complex or intensive needs. So um, from the chat, Janet says functional behavior assessments and behavior intervention plans. Katie says sensory issues, family engagement, and Nancy says assistive technology, functional behavior assessments, family engagement, Bev, um, FBAs, BIPs, and assistive tech. Um, Katie says assistive tech, and Heather, behavior intervention plans and mental health. All right, <clears throat> bear with me. I'm going to take a picture here of our screen before I. Okay. So. Let's. Let's move forward here.
So the state of special education uh, profession survey report, uh, which came from the Council for Exceptional Children, uh, this was uh, from 2019. Um, you know, when we think about um, kind of what teachers shared, and, and these would have been special education teachers, uh, there were um, almost 1,500 uh, total responses. And again, this article uh, would be in your shared uh, folder. I'm not going to pull it up now, but just so you can kind of get a feel for uh, what some of those topics were. Um, the biggest areas that were generated or um, thinking about themes from this survey was um, using um, the IEP, um, participants or respondents feeling of confidence when they're supporting um, some of uh, those students when we think about um, those challenging needs. Um, also, the importance of family engagement came up as a topic. Um, and then um, needing for actual systems um, of support uh, when we think about the delivery of special education. Uh, so more about, you know, do we have um, collaboration time um, embedded within our school schedules? Uh, so we have that, um, the expertise of um, intervention specialist, uh, related service providers, uh, those um, outside resources uh, that would help in terms of supporting a student. Um, and then, um, you know, again, just really uh, some of those same things that kind of surfaced for us. So, um, you know, I heard assistive technology uh, coming, coming up uh, pretty frequently. Um, functional behavior assessments, behavior intervention plans, really thinking about all of those different levels of support that's needed um, to, you know, to help uh, teachers or educators really feel um, competent to supporting our students. So, um, you know, some of the big topics um, that we had thought about in terms of helping to support um, regionally our needs and, and things that we've kind of uh, been mindful of along the way or that have surfaced is, is certainly um, assistive technology uh, and specifically making sure that um, our students have modes of communication established. Um, you know, we want to make sure, you know, specifically that they're understanding, but also are they able to express themselves? And, you know, sometimes when we're trying, you know, after we've um, provided um, some instruction, you know, how, how, how are we able to make sure that um, they, they understood or, or they, they know um, what we were delivering as part of our instruction. Um, also uh, thinking about, you know, how do we select um, appropriate accommodations um, and outcomes for our students? Um, another big topic is, of course, was, um, you know, how are we planning instruction, thinking, thinking about extended standards and those learning progressions. Um, and as we plan instruction, uh, what types of assessments um, do we have um, in terms of monitoring what we're doing uh, to support those students, um, as well as supporting language and literacy uh, for students with complex and intensive needs. Um, we've had an opportunity to really partner um, or work with Shauna Benson out of Ocali, who is the director of um, learners with uh, diverse needs. Um, so we're really looking forward to connecting with her um, and then really bringing in, you know, some of that expertise in these areas that you've identified and um, some of the areas that we were pretty confident would, would surface as a result. So, um, you know, as we move forward, that's kind of what our, our other sessions will be uh, focused on. All right. So the least dangerous assumption, um, I am going to uh, do a new share here. Oops. I'm going to go, I want to pull this particular um, article up. 
just in case you have a hard time accessing it. And this is called uh, the least dangerous assumption. And depending on where you're at, if you're not able to get to this article, um, one of the things that we wanted to have you do is to do a quick read. Um, and this is a multiple page article, but we only want you to read this first page um, and then continued on uh, to page five. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna scroll, look away if you get dizzy here. I'm gonna, this would be uh, kind of the start of page five. So if you will, um, take a few minutes, access the article if, if you're able, um, and we can drop the link uh, back in there in case you missed it uh, the first time. Um, and if you're having a hard time accessing uh, the shared link, uh, put, a, put a note in the chat, but I'll scroll back to the first page. So if you're uh, if you're able to see my screen, uh, you can read from the screen, but let's uh, let's just do a quick read uh, through the first page and page five and jot down any uh, key ideas or things that resonate with you. I know this is not fair on a Monday morning to have you do some intent reading. All right, I'm not quite sure if everybody was able to get through that, um, but just wanted um, <clears throat> to spend a little bit of time here because this, you know, as we're setting the foundation for um, the rest of the sessions, um, this is something that, um, you know, we want to kind of hold um, in the forefront as part of our foundation. Um, anybody um, want to share a, a quick thought or um, something that um, was a big takeaway from what the little bit that you did get to read? I think what I liked about it was, and as someone that has a school psych background and is administering IQ tests and adaptive tests and things of that nature is, you know, we, we tend to get wrapped up in those a lot and not focus on the student and what we see every day versus as a one-time snapshot. So I, I like that you know, assuming competence, assuming that it's the instruction that we can address first, not necessarily that, oh, it's the student. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And I, yeah, how do we get away from, you know, and, and I have been guilty of this when, you know, reviewing a record as it comes in, you know, from a transfer student that we've recently identified. And, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, this is what it says on paper, but we know some of the difficulties um, with some of the um, cognitive testing um, and specifically for this particular population, uh, sometimes we're not always getting that true picture, right? <clears throat> Anybody else? I think what resonated with me is that, you know, if, if we look at a student where they're at now and we just assume that that's the level of learning they're going to obtain in the future, we're really limiting them. Um, and we're not kind of going off of having a growth mindset, assuming that, you know, these kids always can learn, things can change, things can click for them. Um, I've seen it in action. I mean, I, I was, you know, an MD teacher for 21 years. So I've seen students that have severe behaviors, you know, low on paper cognitive abilities that have been integrated into general ed middle school history classes. They're coming out of there spouting this information that I probably will never remember myself. So if we're not exposing them in some way to these higher level concepts, we're doing them a real disservice. Yeah. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, we had a, a little guy with autism. Um, and I believe the last interaction I had was when he was in third grade. And um, the things that he would surprise us with, and because he had a mom who was very adamant about what he was exposed to, um, we were just amazed. And again, it was with her um, I guess, advocacy and with us wanting to make sure that we kept him in the general education setting, um, you know, had we not done those things, 
um, you know, would he have, have, you know, picked up on those, um, those, those new skills and, you know, thinking about the content that he was exposed to. So um, just some highlights that I'll, I'll run through, especially for those of you who maybe have not accessed the article or, um, but, you know, before we can make decisions about instructional programming, so thinking about a student's current abilities, thinking about academic content versus even life skills, um, as well as making decisions about LRE. You know, we truly have to have an understanding of the vision that others have, um, thinking about our students with um, significant cognitive disabilities. And I think Janet brought that up earlier in terms of, you know, thinking about our gen ed partners and, and some of um, our other teachers. And I would probably say there's some intervention specialists out there too. So, um, but by creating this new um, shared belief of high expectations, you know, really uh, thinking about that principle of the least dangerous assumption. Uh, can we make decisions about students' educational programming that will help us to really provide those meaningful experiences um, as well as quality school and not school, not just school experiences, but those life experiences. And then <clears throat> early in the article, um, you know, we we saw the um, reference from Ann Donnellan, uh, the special ed researcher who said the criterion, you know, that least dangerous assumption holds that the absence in that conclusive data, that educational decisions ought to be based on assumptions, which if they're incorrect, will have the least dangerous effect on the likelihood that students will be able to function independently as adults. So, you know, we should assume that poor performance is due to problems Due to problems with our instruction, not the student, you know, so let's question our instruction first and not the student. And, you know, oftentimes how many, how many different learning styles are we dealing with in a, in a given classroom? And oftentimes it, it is us going back to reteach just because of those parameters. So, um, you know, thinking about how we could do uh, things a little bit differently. Um, so, you know, in a nutshell, assuming that students with significant cognitive disabilities, they, they are competent and they're able to learn. Otherwise, um, the result uh, would be harming, uh, including fewer educational opportunities, um, also inferior literacy instructions. We end up seeing separate classrooms and schools or fewer choices. So uh, we want to make sure that we're always with the assumption that they're able to learn. And then um, they talked a little bit about that prevailing paradigm or share view about disability and, and competence. This was the work of Kuhn, you know, um, and he referenced those four characteristics. Intelligence can be um, reliably measured. Um, mental retardation is defined as low level intelligence, can't learn uh, general education content. So we end up placing students um, or limited placement in gen ed classes. And then when we are not sure what students know or can learn, we assume that they can't. So those were kind of those four uh, characteristics that he talked about. Um, and so believing in the paradigm of um, mental retardation, right, leads to low expectations. So this impacts what we believe and the decisions we make again not included in the gen ed setting. Um, sometimes we end up talking to students like they're much younger. And so what happens with that? They get limited vocabulary, limited topics. Um, we don't get to engage them in some of those um, activities, those social activities as their peers. Um, and post-secondary options are limited sometimes. And we heard that topic come up. Um, so we wanna kind of shift and, and thinking about how do we bring some of our, our colleagues along with this new paradigm to understand that or believe, um, having that shared belief that all students have, um, and I should say all people have different skills and talents. Uh, we know that intelligence is not one dimensional um, and can't be measured accurately um, and, reliable, and, and reliably enough, um, you know, to make some of those edu educational decisions just based on an isolated test score. Um, we know that children learn best when they feel valued, um, when people hold high expectations for us or for them, um, and when they feel supported. And I, I think that's all of us just as human beings, right? Um, so we need to presume confidence. All right. And um, 
let's go back here. And a good, a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Pavlik, shared this video, um, and it's a seven-minute clip that I want to share with you. And let's see here. My job. Before we um, view the video, if if you have something to write with, just jot down some of those, some of the highlights uh, or some of the big points um, as you view um, the backwards brain bi bicycle smarter every day. Job is to make college easier because students have a lot on them. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So, the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I sure. couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> All right, I'm just like, oh. All right, so, uh, whatever you're at. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. <laughs> Dude, All right, here we go. Just give it a go. Like you gotta start rolling at least. And go. Oh, go. All right, back up. Okay, Keep your feet on the pedal. Go. Ah. <laughs> Go right off. Just keep your feet on the pedals. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. <laughs> so here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. 
It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you gonna give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up, you got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Everyday Meetup, if you will, and I'm gonna see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm gonna try to ride a normal bike. It's backwards, it's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> yeah. I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it clicked. It clicked. Hold it, it clicked. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Good. Okay, I can run a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. Yes. You think I'm faking? You don't move. It looks so weird to like, you know, not invisible. You think I'm lying, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do. I'm not lying. <laughs> I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Okay, if you want to support Smarter Every Day, you can download a free audio book at audible.com slash smarter. I recommend Commander Hadfield's book, which is an astronaut's guide to life on Earth. I read it. It was awesome. If you think about it, I had to learn how to ride a different kind of bicycle, and my son did as well. But, well, but Commander Hadfield had to learn how to ride a different spaceship. Not only that, but a different type of space station. He was on Mir and the International Space Station. Anyway, if you're interested in supporting Smarter Every Day, audible.com slash smart. Sorry. So, thinking about um, the video, any, any reactions? I've seen this video a couple of times. So um, I just, I, I think that it kind of hammers home for me, the fact that, you know, as we age, we know we don't make those connections as quickly, right? Like I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that would probably take me two years, if at all, to learn how to ride a bike the wrong way. Um, but, you know, when we look at children, they have the capability to make these connections, even if they're children with some cognitive delays. We've got to give them that opportunity to make those connections. Absolutely. Thanks, Janet.
um, you know, and I loved his statement there at the end, be careful how you interpret things. We all have biases, which kind of directly connects back to some of our, our earlier conversations and, you know, knowledge uh, does not equal understanding. Uh, truth is truth. So um, I, you know, I thought it made a nice uh, connection back to some of our, um, our ideas and our, our talking points um, up to this point. Um, one of the things, we're going to take a break here in a little bit, but I wanted to reference some of that uh, research. Um, in the article uh, forward together, there's a couple pages that um, I would earmark, um, and that would be uh, pages 15 and through 16. Um, but the whole article is really um, thinking about one in five students who have learning uh, and attention issues, uh, specifically um, SLD, uh, uh, they referenced ADHD, um, and they talked about the majority of uh, gen ed teachers feel underprepared uh, and unsupported in teaching the one to five, um, and specifically students with behavioral needs. Um, and, you know, also throughout this article, they talk about the evidence of specific critical mindsets um, and key practices to improve learning for all students. This wouldn't just be the one to five, which I know when we're um, thinking about the students through this um, network, those who have significant challenges, uh, complex and intensive needs, um, you know, these mindsets and key practices would be um, helpful for our students. So uh, when we think about those three mindsets, um, they talk about um, having strong uh, self-efficacy, um, positive orientation uh, to inclusion, um, and personal responsibility for all students, right? Even students with disabilities. Um, and it also talks about growth mindset. Um, and I think Janet was the one who kind of uh, talked about the, the growth mindset. Um, and then the other uh, uh, part that I would want to talk about are these eight um, key practices. And, you know, one of the things that um, I guess is hopeful is that a majority of teachers, they do want to learn, you know, how to support students. And, you know, we think about um, our, our students who have just come off um, that um, alternate assessment based on our new decision-making uh, tool. And, you know, how do we support them in, in that general education environment? How can we demonstrate or show that they, they can be supported there, which will take a lot of collaboration um, and, and help uh, with some of our, our teachers. But they talk about eight key practices. And what I like is that it um, for, each, for each of the uh, practices, it talks about um, not only does it provide a brief description, it talks about why it works uh, and what's important to know, but the eight key practices, and I'm sure you will not be surprised by this, uh, but explicit targeted instruction, universal design for learning, um, strategy instruction, flexible grouping, positive behavior strategies, collaboration, um, culturally and linguistically responsive pedagogy, um, and evidence-based content instruction. So those might be some um, pieces to um, um, help when we think about uh, supporting our, our staff. So, um, you know, I, I too believe that, you know, most of us want to do the right thing. It's just oftentimes we're not quite sure how or where to start. So, um, and then there's two other articles in there, Students with Disabilities in Education Policy, Practice and Professional Judgment and Revisiting Expectations for um, Students with Disabilities. And there is um, some direct connection to uh, being confident about the 1% of students who actually need uh, to be alternately assessed um, as, as long as well as this um, other 2% of students who don't need to be alternately assessed, um, but how do we support uh, those students 
um, who may need a little more um, additional support. So, um, and then the revisiting expectations kind of goes back to revisit um, these, uh, those big ideas. So um, anyhow, those two things are in there for you as well. And like I said, we won't spend a lot of time there, but they just um, really address some kind of ahas or some takeaways for us. So, all right. Um, I think at this point we'll take a break. Um, and how about, I have 919. Um, let's come back at 930. So go ahead and take a stretch break, fill up your coffee cup again, um, or your beverage of choice. And uh, yeah, we'll be back at 930. All right. So hopefully everybody was able to refresh their drink and squeeze a little bit of a break in there. I, um, you know, technology is a beautiful thing. I uh, almost ran out of power and was trying to uh, troubleshoot why my battery was dying. So got it figured out now, but goodness. All right, so moving forward. Let's talk a little more about the how, you know, we've been through the why, why the network, you know, why are we thinking about our students with um, those intensive and complex needs? Um, talked a lot about um, presuming competence and, um, you know, really thinking about how we're going to support our teachers who are trying to support our children. Um, so let's, let's think a little more about so really, you know, thinking about where, where do we start, you know, what are the students needs? What do, what do we know? Um, do we even have what we need? So, you know, oftentimes it's, it's these pieces, especially as we have new students uh, to the district or as we have new students in our classrooms, um, you know, or now we have just new needs um, that a student is is coming um, back to school with that we've not seen before, right? We've we've we're, we're going through a, a global pandemic. Um, you know, what are all of the byproducts of of just that? So, really thinking about. Um, you know, what, what do we have in front of us? So of course we can look uh, to that ETR, we can look at all of the medical documentation that we have. You know, we of course get lots of different inter, uh, interview information, whether it's from our parents, from our students, uh, we might have a functional behavior assessment, right? That's one of those big topics that came up earlier. Um, or how about an assistive tech evaluation? Um, those are often evaluations we don't see a lot of. Um, Age-appropriate transition assessments. Um, do we have um, an IEP that's solid? You know, what about those transition plans and thinking about our behavior intervention plans? And again, that's another piece that we think, oh, um, you know, sometimes um, what we have in front of us is is lacking. So. Um, are there other pieces here that when we think about, you know, how we support students, um, are there other pieces of data uh, that you can think of that aren't listed here that, that might help us uh, in terms of giving us a direction? Unmute or throw it in the chat. As you're thinking about other sources or uh, other pieces of information that we could take a look at, I know this probably never has happened to you, but how often do you inherit uh, records of students that are lacking or not real helpful? Does that ever happen? And it could be you inherited it for a number of reasons, just student came to you from another district, <laughs> Janet, all the time. Yeah. So, I wasn't uh, laughing because it's not funny, but George's face on that. I think, um, I think we probably all have got those because <laughs> our eyes got big and I laughed. So it's not a joking matter, but yes, I think that uh, we all can say 
And, yeah. and in, in reality, I know when I was in district that I, that a student left our district and went on with records that probably, um, if you were to have received those weren't real helpful because attendance issues, or I couldn't get um, good collaboration with uh, parents or, you know, so as much as I'd like to say that uh, we were perfect all the time, right? <laughs> Sometimes that happens to us as well, but um, it, it does become very frustrating and especially now, and, and I know in our region specifically that students come and go like nobody's business, right? As soon as they, um, as soon as you feel like you got everything under control, there's five more students who've transferred into the district. So, um, really thinking about, gosh, um, are you know, do we have any gaps uh, where we need additional information, uh, regardless of the reason? So, um, but. Hopefully this graphic uh, looks familiar to you uh, when we think about planning instruction and uh, looking or thinking more specifically about what needed supports um, our students um, need to have in order to be successful. Um, but we, you know, we have to start with looking at the data that we have in order to make those good decisions and even thinking about if we don't have that data to make good decisions, how are we going to get it? So uh, this graphic uh, is just um, of Ohio's uh, cycle of continuous improvement. Um, regardless if you're using the Ohio improvement process, you're using some type of process where you're looking at data, making some decisions about what types of strategies you're going to use um, and a plan for putting those strategies in place and then, um, you know, implementing whatever it is that we've decided to implement and then doing some progress monitoring and then finding some time to, you know, make some decisions about, wow, did it work or did it not work? So um, I know many of you are familiar with some other models, um, but again, this is Ohio's continuous improvement model. And so, you know, as we're thinking about um, our data, um, you know, and, and thinking about the needs of our student. Do we have what we need? Um, um, and, and what are we specifically looking for? And again, uh, trying to think back to that one student that you kind of have in the forefront of um, really uh, creating some challenges for us when we're, when we're working with that student. So, um, you know, one of the first things that we think about is compliance, um, but we also know that compliance is not the end all be all. So there is a folder um, in uh, the shared drive, and I'm going to try to access this. I was not successful last time because we're recording, um, and so I'm going to try again here. Uh, but most of these uh, documents um, are in uh, the shared folder. So hopefully you can still see my screen. Um, if not, somebody throw me a, a bone in the chat, if you will. Um, but these are pretty much those, uh, those documents that we think about um, for um, our students. But the universal supports, um, and pull that up here. Um, I'm not going to go directly to the universal support site, um, but this is um, one of those um, areas uh, and specifically the scripts uh, for each one. Well, actually, I will try to All right, here we go. So on ODE's website, uh, many of you are familiar with these things. I know not all of you uh, perhaps uh, get the luxury of spending a lot of time in the universal support materials, um, but for each component, so for the school age, we see um, the referral and planning part one, summaries of assessment part two, and part three, uh, determining SLD, all for uh, the ETR. And it's these transcripts that I find uh, to be extremely helpful. 
uh, when we think about what should be in these documents that we have in front of us. Um, one of the things that we will quickly point out, um, there is a, a, an update um, or a date that's referenced in terms of when it was last updated. These change all of the time. Um, and I believe if you've not, I think Lydia, you correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was the scripts and the uh, secondary transition perhaps that have been most recently updated for school age. Yes. Uh, so um, the secondary transition ones have been updated. It doesn't look like they've updated them on the site, but hopefully by the end of this month, because we submitted those last week and in our work group. Um, and I believe that all scripts will be updated within the next few months and preschool was just updated in July. Um, so the scripts are real helpful. They accompany the PowerPoint presentation um, and the YouTube um, video. So you have all three of those resources. And it's just important to know that if you go to access those, uh, that the dates change. Um, and I'm going to click into the preschool universal supports, which are found on another page. And one of these um, have been updated even since the, um, and Heather O'Connor, I'll pick on you just because I know that you participated in um, or have had some conversations um, most recently. Um, one of these have just been updated like within the past week. <laughs> I can't remember which one Ian and I discovered it. So, you know, as soon as you think you have the most current one, there's something uh, that has changed. So just know that that's one of those um, guiding um, supports. And then I'm gonna go back. Um, again, I know many of you are familiar with these items and I hate to, pick on or talk a lot about compliance, but it is what it is. Those things have to be present in the record. Um, and of course, uh, when they're completed um, and completed accurately, it, it is extremely helpful, but these are the most recent IDEA um, monitoring uh, tools that's part of the, um, the uh, IDEA monitoring process um, guide. And I suspect that we'll see new versions of this. And I think Michelle Jordan, just because you're on the call, um, I believe this is the, um, <laughs> the documents that <clears throat> are being used or referenced as part of <clears throat> monitoring uh, for Zanesville. Uh, but yes, they are. Okay, thanks. Um, it says November 2020. However, we didn't, it didn't land with us until January. So sometimes you'll notice a little lull uh, in terms of when things uh, become available to us. But the way these are set up is you've got the record review item um, for this particular area, which is child fine. So all those things specific to evaluation um, are listed here. Um, or in the orange, and then they actually cite the regulation, and then they provide you with the record review question in terms of what they're what they're offering or asking. I'm going to actually scroll down, look away. If you get dizzy here, let's go to let's start with this one. This is like a hot topic one. CF2 again, still under child fine. Does the educational agency provide interventions to resolve concerns for any child who's performing below grade level? On this particular question, they give a preschool clarifier, but this is the level of evidence that they're after. Um, and I know this becomes um, an issue in our in our programs, but again. Um, you know, thinking about initials versus reavows, and then they clearly outline what it is that they're looking for. And then um, this is potential areas that they would be looking to see um, or looking for that particular level of information. And look away again, you'll find that there are several, uh, goes through CF10, um, and then we move on to delivery of services, which is in blue. Um, and this would be all specific to the IEP. 
Um, we did put in um, the shared folder the um, indicator 13 uh, checklist, but you'll also find that it's embedded as part of DS1 uh, for those of you who, um, when we think about secondary uh, transition um, and transition planning. So it starts uh, there with DS1, but as you scroll through here, um, you'll see different uh, record review items. And again, these are the things that they would be looking for um, if you were going through a monitoring visit. Uh, otherwise, these would be things that we would want to be mindful of as, as we're working with our teachers um, and our related service providers um, in terms of what would be compliance. So, um, and then there is one, I'll scroll down, look away. I'll scroll down through here. There is one question in purple. Uh, for LRE, um, so this is the this is the current tool, but we know that uh, we anticipate there will be other uh, another <clears throat> record review tool that may include um, more changes. Uh, we've also learned that Office of Early Learning will be completing their own monitoring. So for those of you who are in preschool. And of course, preschool certainly can have students who have some pretty intensive uh, and complex needs as well, but there will be a separate tool um, for uh, preschool. Um, so we anticipate that as well. All right. And actually, I want to stay here for just a moment. I want to go to You know, when we think about um, our students who have complex needs, you'll see um, uh, DS9. This is uh, specifically address addressing assistive technology. And I know this was kind of a, uh, a hot topic that was addressed earlier. You know, do we, um, do we have evaluations uh, specifically that address uh, assistive tech uh, was one of the um, concerns, um, or, you know, do we need to, perhaps we have some assistive tech, whether it's low tech, high tech, uh, but maybe we need to consider some additional items. So there is um, a um, item here. And then even for our students who we don't think requires assistive tech, uh, one of the big conversation pieces has been, how did we consider assistive technology in our IEPs and simply marking the box under special instructional factors really doesn't constitute, um, you know, that consideration by the team of um, aspects of AT that a, that a student may be eligible for. So uh, that will be uh, in our future sessions. We'll work. We'll kind of unpack that a little more uh, and perhaps bring in some outside expertise uh, in that area. And then DS10, uh, does the IEP identify accommodations to provide, um, provided to enable the child to access um, and make progress in the general curriculum? Um, and so, you know, we're looking for uh, in that section seven under specially designed services accommodations, and we know those accommodations um, it's, you know, something that we're giving the child um, to access court course content, but by, a no, by no means are we altering um, the complexity of the content. And then DS11 um, is where we see um, uh, modifications being mentioned um, and some clarifiers in terms of you know, what are we changing uh, to the content in terms of what students are expected to learn, um, where the amount or complexity of materials is altered from the grade level curriculum. And again, this is something that would really be um, considered for just a very small population of children, right? Um, certainly as we think about um, our students with the most significant cognitive disabilities, um, but, you know, we know that as, as, you know, our conversations um, 
and earlier, you know, the more we start modifying, we start losing some of those um, high expectations that we want to make sure we still have for our students. So um, I just wanted to point uh, those sections out. And then um, there's also uh, support for school personnel, um, you know, thinking about those adult to adult interactions that are happening, and especially for our students uh, with um, complex and intensive needs, we should see um, lots of things happening um, enlisted in this particular uh, section, <clears throat> especially when we think about students with most significant cognitive disabilities. So anyhow, those are there for you. Um, and then, We'll, we'll kind of talk about these other pieces as we move into uh, the later part of the um, presentation. But um, so we know that um, some other things that we probably could have listed um, in the requirements uh, in terms of being compliant, uh, we probably, uh, the functional behavior assessment could be listed in this section, especially when we have a student who really has some challenging behaviors, um, also behavior intervention plan. Um, so those are the things that we think of at a minimum uh, for students. Um, but as we think about supporting students, you know, we want to think about how are we going to improve learning outcomes for um, our students, which would make us think about, you know, other um, uh, other data, other areas, um, such as, um, you know, do we have access to expertise um, relating to students, students needs? Sometimes we we're working with our boards of DD. Um, I know that looks differently across our region and across boards of DD, but oftentimes they bring a level of expertise um, that perhaps we don't have. Uh, maybe it's we're interacting with O'Kelly um, in terms of thinking about um, assistive tech or how, how else we might support diver diverse learners. Um, Ohio Center for Deaf Blind Ed, um, lots of different um, areas of expertise that we could be pulling in in terms of improving outcomes. Um, collaboration with other colleagues. Um, <clears throat> I know that this is um, challenging with some of our school schedules, um, but again, your, your coworkers, your um, related service providers, your gen ed teachers, your intervention specialists collectively, uh, you know, require um, you know, coming together and thinking about how are we going to plan instruction. Um, and then, you know, we, we might find that we have, we have gaps, right? Um, looking back at those records uh, for the student, what other assessments are we going to need? What other data would help us um, kind of complete the picture or put uh, more color to the picture that we currently have? Um, thinking about um, our parents, uh, family engagement, um, how, you know, when we look at those documents, um, do they tell us a story about, uh, was it hard to engage our families? Um, did we get input in terms of um, the IEP, you know, in, in the future planning and the present levels and our profiles? You know, did they help us prioritize learning outcomes for the student? I know we had a um, preschooler uh, when I was in district um, who really had some pretty intensive medical needs uh, and um, communication needs. And um, I, I think I could have done a better job of, of interacting with that, that parent um, and engaging them in, in some of those um, just very early on um, events in terms of planning for their, their child. You know, sometimes uh, considering the severity of the disability and uh, needs of the student, um, sometimes working with or always working with that family, uh, helping uh, collectively to come up with um, you know, planning instruction and, and um, outcomes for the student as, as well as accommodations in terms of what are priorities for them to ensure that, you know, we're on the same page 
um, and, and critical in establishing that relationship with the family, um, you know, will certainly um, increase the academic success or improve um, academic success for that child. So um, that piece is huge. And um, I don't think um, we probably spend enough time around that area. So, you know, thinking how we can prioritize needs and um, any reactions or thoughts to, to just this piece or, or things that you've experienced along the way? I'm going to mute, throw it in the chat. Holly, I just wanted to um, point out too that in your shared folder that you were just sharing, I added some resources um, when we're talking um, a little bit further about alternate assessment and kind of like what you had mentioned, um, you know, I always say plan with the end, you know, start with the end and, and see what we need to do. There's a good resource I put in there that has accommodations that we may put in place in IEPs for school age or high school students. Um, and if they are college bound, um, what are though, how does that translate? Are they still going, is that an accommodation? Um, or modification that's still available for them or not. Um, so kind of going along with what you said, uh, making sure that they can access what they need to be successful, but also looking at when we can start weaning some of that away to make them more independent and make sure that they have the skills they need if they are a college bound or, or um, a vocational school bound student. And then also the um, alternate assessment, the most recent um, scores standards have been released in July. We're, I'm going to go over them in a little bit later, but when we're talking about the alternate assessment and kind of um, goal setting based off of what they've done before, that's a good chart to reference. Um, thanks, Lydia. Um, yeah, so as, as we think about this area of um, alternate assessment and as we're thinking about improving outcomes for for students and um, these were some questions that for districts who had an indicator finding um, because uh, for a variety of reasons but mostly because they've exceeded that one percent threshold um, and many of you um, have exceeded that one percent threshold that's uh, something across our region and, and really across the state uh, that has become a focal point for us. But these, we pulled these questions um, from the self-review summary report, and, and these were questions that districts had to, excuse me, um, really think about and address um, any areas of concern and potential root cause um, for um, priority areas that were identified. So we wanted to give you just a couple minutes um, in some breakout rooms uh, to have some discussions around these areas. Um, and um, so we'll spend just a little bit of time um, in the breakout session and uh, give you some time uh, to talk about those things. And I in the chat, I think, <laughs> um, I'm not sure uh, that you were able to access this before, uh, is the, the sheet um, or the actual uh, handout that has these questions on it. So when you're in your small group, uh, you don't have to try to remember those. Hopefully you're able to access that. I tried to manipulate the settings to make sure that you were able to access that. So let's see here try to get you into breakout rooms again. All right, welcome back. So does anybody want to share um, a response or any conversation that you had around the first item? How do teams confirm students identified for alternate assessment have a disability that significantly impacts intellectual functioning? Holly, our group only made it through the first question. So All I'm right. going to share. <laughs> um, 
So what we talked about was, you know, the people that were in my group maybe aren't the ones that needed to hear this. It's that trickle down effect and making sure everyone does. The biggest thing is, um, you know, people often just look at what the IQ is and think that that's what is still going to qualify them for alternate assessment. So we discussed um, making sure that all of our team members are aware of the new checklist determination tool um, and actually maybe even, you know, in our spare time, getting a case study together and having the team fill it out and maybe think of the student what you thought the outcome was going to be before and then really going through that checklist and looking at their strengths and getting everyone's input because really you're looking not just what they can't do you're looking at what they can do um, and I think that this will probably make a little more sense to I said when we talk about House Bill 110 in just a few in a few minutes, because it's going to talk about what we're doing as far as alternate assessment and, and making sure those determinations are done. Yeah, absolutely. We didn't get past that. So that's the only one my group can discuss. Sure. Thank you, Lydia. Um, so, yeah, really thinking about, um, you know, more than just that IQ test. Right. Um, and really thinking about, um, you know, going back and looking at that ETR, what other aspects do we have uh, in terms of um, that intellectual functioning? So, um, yeah. And so the second question, how do teams confirm students who are placed on alternate assessment have adaptive behavior skills assessments and or goals included in their IEPs? Anybody, anybody get that far? <laughs> Anybody want to just comment? Holly, I, I think that um, our team, and I guess we kind of looked at all of these really in only one question. Sure. Um, we really are stuck on the fact that the majority of our students who have previously been on alternate assessment are no longer qualifying uh, because of the use of the word and in the flow chart. And it's creating a lot of frustration for parents, for teachers, um, you know, for administrators as well, using that chart, it, it seems as though if a student's capable of doing just about anything, they're no longer qualifying for that. And going from alternate assessment to just a, a generalized state test is such a huge leap in terms of what they need to understand, um, the knowledge that they would have had to have had put forth in front of them, that we don't feel that it's what's best for kids at all. And it's, it's difficult to sit and present that to a family and also to my ISs when I feel pretty strongly that we're not doing what's best for kids by using that. Yeah. And Janet, the flow chart that you're talking about, the one that's embedded in the IEP itself that has the three questions, that? No, I'm talking about the guidance from ODE that had the, you know, with the stop continue. Okay. I, I just wanted to be clear. We were talking about the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. If it, you those three questions, we would still be qualifying a lot of the students, but when we, you know, defer to that document to make what we, we want to make the right decision, it is just knocking almost all of our kids off of that alternate assessment. So, so I think that, go ahead, Lydia. Go ahead, Holly. No, go ahead. So I think that, um, and I'm actually, if Brian is still on, I'm kind of, I'm going to call him out on this because I believe that he was on the Thank discussion you. when that <laughs> form was created. Um, and actually, um, it's not intended to be an and statement that you have to have everything in one column or not. It's that you can, they can go back and forth, but you're ultimately picking the, the column that they have the most in. And when there's a question about that, you're falling back. So Brian, do you want to answer that since you were, you were on that? Yeah. And I think, you know, the guidance uh, for, the, for those of us working on, you know, trying to make this change that they wanted it to be stricter, not necessarily because, you know, they think that, I don't know, that we were doing kids wrong by having them on there. But I think part of it was comes to the fact of federal funding. And that was a big play in it, um, that we're going to lose a lot of federal funds if we don't make changes that we needed to be more uh, reflective of our students and having that growth mindset, I guess. But uh, 
yeah, I mean, without looking at it in particular, um, yeah, it definitely was something that they wanted us to, wanted it to make a lot more stringent on, um, you know, you would see kids that had like mild intellectual disabilities on there or um, some other the case examples that they they gave us it was pretty shocking at some of the students i i, I think janet what i i'm getting with you and i think what most of us are seeing is that you know the kids that are maybe in between like aren't quite just mild or maybe aren't quite extremely severe those are the kids that we're really struggling with on this this tool um brian I that, that's the that feedback i'm getting yeah um, I appreciate that too, but, you know, for us, it, the document, you know, really is best guidance coming from ODE and you, you see pretty clearly there on the screen that the use of that word and, um, I had to disqualify so many students last year that have, you know, been in self con self-contained type classrooms for the majority of their education, appropriately so, but they were disqualified from alternate assessment. They weren't on the edge. They weren't a bubble kid. You know, they truly could have benefited from staying on alternate assessment. And I came from a district, we were below the 1% cap, well below. And then we just dropped even lower because we were disqualifying kids that really should still be on that. So I think the verbiage in that is really making people struggle um, and making us make decisions for kids that as, as teams, we don't really agree with. Yeah. Thanks, Janet. I, I appreciate everybody's comments. And this has certainly been a very passionate, passionate topic <laughs> and, and rightfully so it's, it, it is hard to go from one extreme to the next. Um, we knew in the state of Ohio that there was an issue with, with our numbers, um, and so this piece um, kind of spoke to, I think Ohio is like the second worst state uh, when you looked at all states across the board. And not only were we the worst uh, state, we just hadn't made historically any movement with improving our percentage. So um, I, this, you know, I, I totally understand this feeling of abruptness. Um, but when we look at the tool, and I'm just going to go here now, I was going to save it for later. Um, but when we think about the um, this first big piece, when we look at, sorry if I'm making you dizzy here, when we're looking at adaptive skills, we've got these three big categories, conceptual, the conceptual domain. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> the conceptual domain, and then um, moving on through the social and practical. And so for this section, you do have to be in the column four for each one of these areas. So students daily functioning align only within column four of all three adaptive skills, this student would be considered the most significant cognitive disability. And that's where we see kind of all of these ands um, that um, Janet had mentioned. And then as we go on to curriculum instruction and assessment, um, here we see that word presume competence, right? Um, and I think that came up earlier as well in, in the document, but when, when we're not quite sure between which column, um, then we presume competence and select the earlier column. Um, and then it's in this section where uh, the student's characteristics in the columns um, can be in three or four only. And it talks about, you know, that that need for extended, extensive direct and individualized instruction uh, with learning targets aligned to Ohio's learning standards extended. And then you also see that language and requires substantial supports uh, to achieve measurable gains. Um, so yeah, it's 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 been a little bit difficult in terms of the transition. Um, and um, one of the things that I was not aware of, and, and perhaps you all picked up on this 
or maybe these um, items didn't land. And I'm going to jump out of here for just a moment. Well, maybe not. I'll stay here. There were three documents that landed on ODE's website in May, or at least that's when it says they were, um, that's, that's when it says that they landed there. I do not remember seeing these documents, but they were all to support families. Um, and I believe Mel Cronenball uh, at ECO ESC as part of her last meeting also uh, shared these, but this was um, an FAQ for families and it really talks about uh, what is the alternate assessment, um, why, um, why do uh, students with significant cognitive disabilities have to take a uh, state test, um, it goes through how it will be administered in terms of the AA, um, the design of it, specific grade and content areas. Um, let's see if I can pull up the others. Here's another one that talks specifically about extended uh, standards and instruction for students who participate. Um, so this one really speaks to, you know, what are these extended standards? What does that mean? Um, and what does it mean in relation to um, instruction as well as assessment? And it goes on to talk about um, what does it look like? Um, and just the importance of um, making sure that students have access to academic content as well as functional skills and how the extended standards address that. And then uh, who takes the alternate assessment? So we're talking more about eligibility and participation um, in the alternate assessment. Um, have you all seen these already? Am I just late to the ball game? You can put a Y in the chat if you've seen them already. All right. So day late, dollar short, right? <laughs> I had not seen those until um, putting this uh, presentation together. So I wasn't quite sure when they officially landed there. Um, but, um, oh, Bev, thank you. I, for some reason, missed that one. <laughs> Apparently that notification went out in the Ohio update from ODE. So um, anyhow, these are all in the shared folder uh, for you. And um, I did want to talk just briefly, and Lydia, if you want to uh, jump in here in terms of um, just talking about post-secondary outcomes for students at um, all grade levels for the alternate assessment. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. I'm going to have to turn <laughs> my video off because my connection's lagging since I'm at home. Hang on. Okay, sure. Okay, so um, when we talk about that again, I was trying to pull it up. There's a really good visual from ODE that they had put out a couple years ago that said start with the end in mind and had the planning and about what your student wanted to look, you know, what they want, what they saw in their future. So when we think about alternate assessment, we do need to look at, you know, if that student might be a bubble student, what, what are they planning to do? Are they looking at the military? Are they looking at a technical school? Are they looking at um, being college bound and planning ahead? So we're always talking about that sooner than later. And I think one of the biggest discussions is that, you know, it's fluid. If you have a kiddo that you go through, you know, third grade, fourth grade, and you think that at that time they need to be on alternate assessment, and then that's why we need to do that checklist at every 
Um, I, you know, every year, yearly at every IEP meeting, when we are annual meeting, when we're making that determination, because if, you know, if something clicks kind of like, you know, referencing the video back that Holly showed um, about riding the bicycle, if something that our intervention specialists and our related service providers are doing and something clicks for that student and we realize that, you know what, maybe it's time to push them a little bit more. Maybe they can take the test and they can go off of auto assessment. That's okay. Once they're on it does not mean that they're on it all the way through until they get to graduation. Okay. So I think that's the biggest part about thinking about um, if they are on an assessment or if they're not, and that it's fluid, that you can move on and off and that you definitely do need to think about um, the end goal for the student um, when you're planning for that. Thanks, Lydia. Um, so we wanted to share this with you um, in addition to teams having to go through these and, and these weren't the only questions. These were just some, I guess, um, passionate conversations uh, that were had as part of those discussions. And um, another layer is that um, for for districts that had this finding, they were also required to develop a procedure around alternate assessment. Um, so we know that um, OEC, um, every document you put your hands on, if there's some kind of action, uh, action step that a district's uh, required to do, whether it's through OEC monitoring, whether it's through an indicator finding for whatever reason, they want to see your special education procedures. So um, that might be something uh, that you put um, kind of on the to do if you don't already have one, um, just you might save yourself some um, some time, uh, but even thinking about, you know, as we work with our, um, our district teams or our local teams in terms of um, having a, uh, a procedure of how things flow and how these decisions are made uh, would be helpful. All right, so um, we went through those family resources, but just as a reminder, um, you could have a situation depending on when that, uh, when we receive notification that teams must uh, start using this tool, I guess it could be possible uh, that some students uh, maybe who had uh, didn't have or already had their IEP meeting and, um, you know, there was some question in terms of uh, qualification for the alternate assessment um, where that, that IEP meeting happened early in the fall after that, um, that guidance came out. But remember, any year a student could participate in the state's general assessment and prior to them participating in alternate assessment, we must complete the tool. So, um, just a reminder that moving forward, this will, this will be true for, for all students. And um, we just wanted to highlight um, some professional learning opportunities. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, um, we have um, at the SST, uh, there are lots of uh, different uh, opportunities available to um, programs or for teachers, educators, um, and I'm just going to pull up kind of what's, um, you know, how you access um, those different events. And sorry, I think I jumped too soon. Um, we do put out a, uh, a fall catalog in terms of um, specific events, but this kind of takes you to the landing page of the SST website. And this is kind of where you can see all of the, the good things that are happening. Um, I think um, itinerant teacher network is coming up soon. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Lydia will be um, hosting the uh, Secondary Transition Network. And uh, we have October 5th uh, will be the Special Ed Directors Network. So there's just uh, different things um, that, are, that are happening across the, um, 
over the next uh, several months here. So make sure that you check out that. And I want to go quickly to just because it's coming up soon and I, I want to make sure that I mention it. These are the different um, opportunities, but because assistive tech uh, was such a, a hot topic, uh, the state AT conference and vendor fair is happening on September 29th. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that flyer. More recently, we've had uh, questions around um, the OPEP, um, Perfect. Well, we've we've had lots of um, questions about how to uh, best support uh, paraprofessionals. So in here is the um, OPEP series, and if you just scroll through there, it's five pages long of, of different opportunities. So just to point that out, if we're uh, looking uh, for ways to support um, parapros um, and um, Supporting Communicative Competence Professional Learning Series. Again, thinking about um, our, our students who are, are challenged with um, communication. Um, again, if you scroll through here, there's a laundry list of different offerings. And this too is appropriate for paraprofessionals. And then most recently, um, this is um, a new web series uh, developed by Ocali, um, accessing the general curriculum for all, learner, all learners. Um, and um, just so you know that uh, that's in there for you and, and a link in terms of how you can get started. So lots of different options when we think about um, our students. And I think I just added in there as well the um, transition newsletter for S September that had some links for um, our transition meetings and then some updates and then the um, Sherry's CTPD meetings. I also put that in there. Okay. And Lydia, I don't know. Um, I'm going to pass it over to you for those updates. And I stopped sharing. And I, I, one of the things I didn't mention was OcaliCon that we know that's coming up as Lydia's um, pulling up um, the updates so she can share those with you. OcaliCon will actually be happening um, November 16th through the 19th. Okay, can you see my screen? We sharing okay. Okay, I do want to be mindful of our time, but there was a, just a few things. Um, and if you're coming tomorrow, I'm going to go into these more in detail, and I'm sure that we'll touch base with them again um, in our special education directors meeting. There's a few things on House Bill 110, which I know it's a pretty lengthy document. Um, so I just pulled out a few pages that I thought were important for us and those on the call to, um, to look at when we were talking about some of the graduation requirements um, and some of those items that go along with alternate assessment. The first part of the, this clip that I have clipped out for you guys is just like five pages um, is talking about the graduation requirements and assessments. What I will say is that um, chart that I had pulled up earlier about, let me, I'm going to get back to Holly's. about the performance standards. These performance standards were released, I think in July, if you've, had a, if you've gotten them yet, but if not, they're in there. And these are the most recent um, performance standards for the alternate assessment. And we're looking at um, really that proficient is what we were looking at. When we're talking about the House Bill 110 and a ways, back over here so sorry when we're looking at that competency score um when we go when we're looking at algebra one english um language arts two and of course exams or the alternate assessment it says a score determined 
um, by the state. That initially we thought was going to be kind of mirror to those proficient scores, and they've decided that they're going to hold off and let us know what those are. I'm going to get down to where this makes more sense. Maybe. Okay. So under when we we're talking about exemptions for certain students with IEPs that the student must take algebra one and English language arts to end of course exam or the alternate assessment in math and English language arts. If the student does not attain a competency score um, on an end of course exam or a score established by the state board on the alternate assessment. So what I'm saying is we don't have those cut scores yet, but it looks like they're going to be probably those proficient scores or above, but we don't have that set amount, that set number yet. The student must be offered and receive remedial support for students um, by the district or school to retake the exam or assessment. So why I wanted to point this out is kind of we started talking about equity and making sure that all of our learners are having um, the same opportunities. So one discussion I had with the district was after your students take that assess or take their, uh, you know, end of course exam or they take the, I'm sorry, not end of course exam, they take the assessment um, and you get put into remediation, whether you have a um, enrichment period or you have so many times a month that you're meeting with the students that are on the bubble to get that score, are you including the IEP students or 504 students or any student um, that may have a disability? And most often the question were, well, they're getting some sort of remediation, but I don't really know what it is because they're going to the IS. So they're really not getting the same as what their peers are because now they will take that, and if they aren't proficient or they don't meet that cutoff score, districts will need to um, provide evidence that they are giving some remediation and remedial support before they take again. And then when they take, if they still are not proficient or don't meet that cutoff score, then and only then can we decide if we're going to exempt them from the consequences of the test. So that's a little bit different how we're going to be making sure that we get that remediation piece in there. Um, and then also just the citizenship um, in the science and how they're able to get that. It's not going to be just the end of a course um, <clears throat> exam, excuse me. <clears throat> it now says that um, what's highlighted down here, if you see that in addition to the classes that it's talking about, that the, this will permit a student with significant cognitive disability to earn the citizenship or science diploma seal by attaining scores, again, set by the state on the audit and assessment in social studies or science. So as soon as we get those scores, that's going to make it a, a, that's going to make um, a difference for our learners. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that's all I was going to share on the House Bill 110. Um, but if you have questions, please unmute or put them in the chat. The second important thing that I thought that I wanted to share with this group were the ACT accommodation. So before, if you had a student that was going to take the ACT, you know, it was like tons of paperwork just to trying to make sure that they could take the exam and have some of those accommodations in place. So now um, it is, it, it's going to be a little more streamlined. You'll still go on the ACT site. And I think I have this in the other folder. I didn't put it in this one. Um, you'll fill out and you'll let them know. And once you supply them with that IEP, they will be able to better accommodate. It'll be much smoother for them to get those same accommodations to take the ACT. So that is a really big thing. Um, I'll look for it when I'm not sharing and, send, and put the link for the blog in, in the chat for you. But again, we'll be going over it a little bit more tomorrow. <clears throat> The other area that I just wanted to touch base on was um, the revised rule for implementation of PBIS and the use of restraint and seclusion. I'm going to stop sharing because I did not pull that up for you. Um, but a couple of things that we need to be mindful of um, are that after the third incident of a restraint or seclusion, now we must meet within 10 days for a functional behavior assessment 
or to update the behavior intervention plan. Um, if the student has an IEP or a 504, then that's their team meeting. If it's a student that maybe is not identified yet, then that's the general education team, the teacher, admin, trained person. I know that we wear lots of many hats, um, but this is really one of those um, teams that we need to be present on to help with our students with disabilities and make sure that we um, they are being addressed. Um, kind of like we started in the beginning, Holly said, what all information are we looking at? If it's not a team that doesn't um, understand our students' unique needs or maybe what they've gone through or what they've had before, um, then you know we, that's what's best for our students to make sure that we're present there for that. Um, the training that goes along with that, it's just something to think about for your teams. It's pretty much, written out about the crisis management and de-escalation techniques that will be used by the districts. Um, <clears throat> for instance, if you're using CPI, it now has to be face-to-face. -face. It has to be the practical portion. We can no longer skip. I know because of COVID, um, some of us had skipped that and it was just written on our blue card, but we do have to have a test and demonstrate the knowledge of those skills. And um, also we have to have a plan in place. It's, it specifically calls out for the plan to be documented and, and embedded for substitute teachers um, so that anyone in those classrooms um, knows how uh, kind of the process and the procedure and where we need to go. The last thing I was going to touch on really quick was the um, OLTS, the Ohio Longitudinal um, Transition Survey. Those results are back. I am going to drop that in um, your shared folder. It's very, um, the five points and the bit major points are, are they're, they're really um, eye-opening um, about what students are receiving um, transition support and what are not or you know, report that they are not, and also the use of maybe OOD and some of those other um, entities that we have working with our students. Just for sake of time, I'm not going to go through all of that with you, but I did wanted to tell you that that is out. I don't think it's on the website yet, but like I said, I'm gonna put it in your um, shared folder now. Were there any questions? I know I flew through those, but. Lydia, I had a question. Sure. Um you had mentioned a plan documented for subs that are going into these classrooms. Do you have specifics on what needs to be included in that? There is, let me get back to my screen where I can see you. There is not. However, there is an FAQ and some guidance that's supposed to be coming out that when we had our meeting that they said that they that would be coming out soon. I have not received it yet. Okay, well, um, will you, let us know or how will we know when that does come out, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I will tell you, I hope that it will be out by our October meeting, but when anything comes out with PBS and restraint and seclusion, um, I will always make sure that it is, um, that it gets out in our secondary transition. Um, Holly and I do this one together and then our special ed meeting. But also if something comes out on that, that might be a bullet that would come out on our transition um, network newsletter that we'll be getting out monthly. So if you're not on that list, Janet, make sure you send me a message and I'll make sure that you get on that. So yeah, if that comes up, that is one of the big ones that we'll make sure that you all get your information on. Thank you. You're welcome. And I would also share that um, oftentimes out of our office, any big Ohio ed update or notification, well, Lisa will, Lisa Baker, our um, SST 12 director, will send those communications through Cheryl Rayburn, who is our um, administrative assistant. But it, just so you know who Cheryl is, <laughs> it's usually sending those communications for Lisa or on Lisa's behalf. So we try to hit you as, <laughs> as much as we can on, on different formats to make sure that, uh, you know, sometimes you're hearing the information three times um, in different um meetings and, and formats, but we just want to make sure that you get the information. So that that might be one way that you get that as well. So, okay. And I did drop in under your research um, folder, just that, um, that report for the OLTS so that you'll have that. But like I said, we're going to go through that a little bit more tomorrow. And we definitely will in October too, because there's some direct correlation about um, how we're planning for our students and how we're supporting those.
All right. So, oops. I went too fast. Let me get out of there. So, um, as we think about today's content and information, we wanted uh, to give you an opportunity to kind of share maybe some of um, the wows or the things that you felt like, oh, this is maybe new or maybe something useful, thinking about the one student that I have that, you know, kind of poses some of those challenges or uh, just something that might be um, helpful for you. Um, and then things that we're still wondering about. So um, the QR code is there. Um, if you want to access that, it will take you straight to the idea board. And I'm going to give you just a minute to access that. And I will um, go ahead and click directly into the idea board. Um, so um, as you're looking, if you've not used the ideas boards, um, if you click um, on the wow or the wonder, that's where you can um, get a sticky note um, or a post-it note and you can add um, a comment um, just by uh, typing in there. And um, same thing for wonders. Um, you can generate a sticky that way. So if you would take just a minute and um, add um, a comment uh, for both, that would be helpful, especially as we think about next time. While you're doing that, I did pull up the announcements that was from July 26th um, about the ACT honoring IEP and 504 accommodation. So that link is in the chat if you wanna look at that a little closer. I want to give folks a couple more minutes. Um, I anticipate that there's probably folks who are trying to, you know, do five things at once just because the nature of the job, right? <laughs> But this will be helpful as we think about um, how to move forward. So.
as as folks are completing this, um, I I have a a question or a um, a thought. I guess more of a question. So for those of you who are not teachers, so most of you, <laughs> is there a likelihood that teachers will be able to participate? Um, in the future sessions, you can either unmute or, um, I mean, I feel like I kind of know the answer, but I, you know, if somebody can speak to it a little more. Yeah. Thanks, Janet. That's, that's kind of what I was thinking. Janet, I also, I put in the link uh, or in the chat, the link for um, the PBIS. I did get on ODE's, um, I'm sorry, on the YouTube subscription for ODE. And it looks like that restraint and seclusion recording has not been put up yet, um, hopefully within in the month, but the information will be there. Um, and then it was Emily Jordan who presented on that. And she has had said that they were working on that guidance. So again, as soon as we get that, we'll make sure it gets pushed out. Thank you. All right, so um, I think I'm going to go ahead and just um, move forward. If people are still putting things in the idea boards, that's awesome. And if not, um, yeah. <laughs> but so like our next steps, um, I don't know if this was, um, if I captured this well or not, but uh, looking at the, this is a form that is in your, um, that's in the folder. Um, and I'll make sure that you're able to access that because um, this is one of the things I kind of added at the last minute, um, just wanting to make sure that um, kind of had a structure in place for the next meeting time. So October 13th, um, which you'll see at kind of at the bottom of the page from two to three, that's that optional time frame um, that we're going to meet. Um, or Lydia and I, or at least myself, will be available um, just to kind of um, connect um, with you all. Um, if there are things that you take back um, and share with your teachers and have um, something that you would like for them to do, that, is, uh, that works as well. Because um, our, our intent was really to support uh, the teachers and, and how they're... Um, um, interacting with students and, and trying to support them. So, um, but realizing the situation with our subs, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, how, how feasible that will be. So um, you very well could take some information back um, and, and share and, and have them do some things. But the, the whole intent of this next steps is really, um, I, I'm the kind of person, if I don't take something that I've learned from the session, um, <laughs> you know, and, and actually use it, um, I'm going to lose it. So we're really just wanting you to take something and it can be something small. I put some examples in here, but really anything from today, um, if it's checking out, you know, those online modules from Ocali, if it's using those uh, family resources as you're working with families. Um, maybe it's making sure that your staff have those universal support scripts or uh, going through the ETR IEP record review tools. Um, this was just a way to kind of um, uh, record your area of focus and then some reflections uh, so that when we come back together, whether it's October 13th, again, that is optional. Um, or November 30th, which is our next time um, for this, this larger groups um, for our next kind of um, area of focus or, or content related uh, to kind of our um, areas that we addressed earlier today, uh, then this will give you something to kind of trigger like, oh yeah, this is what I did. Cause I know that that's a long time <laughs> from now until then, till we come back together. So, 
um, that's in there. And then go back. Any reactions to that or, you know, again, I don't get, want to give you just one more thing to do. This is really more about how can we help our students and or teachers um, who are supporting those students. So I know your plates are extremely full. And Holly, is that November 30th um, date? What's the time on that one? It'll be the same 8 to 11. Okay, thank you. And if and if, if you already have something that's happening, you know, certainly you can, you know, take care of what you need to and um, or if you have to miss a particular day, we're going to try to keep things recorded and keep building our um, shared folders. Um, I know there were multiple people who didn't come today, um, but they'll still have access because they've registered um, to the information in the shared folders. All right, and then I'm going to go back here. Um, you'll, you'll see our social media info here. Um, we do send a lot out on uh, Twitter and um, Facebook, so uh, follow us. And here is um, today's link for the evaluation, which will then direct you to a certificate for today. So um, yeah, so glad that you guys were able to break away and, and spend some time here and um, look forward to the uh, next session and it'll be the same Zoom link. I set it up as a recurring. So whether you're joining us on the October 13th or November 30th, it'll be the same link. And then the last slide has Lydia and I's direct contact information, which you have on the SST contact list as well. Um, whoever asked about the recordings, yes, the the, the recordings we're going to try to make available um, for staff trying to get a little more savvy with the technology. We thought that might be a way for teachers um, to be involved, even if it's indirectly. And once you've completed the evaluation, um, you know, as long as you don't have any questions or concerns, you're free to go and we look forward to seeing you again soon.